book of Luke with me tonight, please. Luke chapter number 2, verse 41. Luke 2, 41. Uh, Luke chapter number 2, verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, Pascha, suffering. And when he was 12 years old, Bar Mitzvah becomes the son of the law. They went up to Jerusalem, the custom of the feast, and when they'd fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. Notice he's called the child Jesus. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it, but they supposing him to have been in the, in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Father, bless your holy word now. Bless these folks who've come to hear it, those that will watch it tonight as it streams out live, and those that will watch it later. Bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. You can be seated. Luke is, uh, gets into particulars, the others don't. And uh, Luke, as, as I've told you before, is the historian. He mentions places and names in, secular, in the secular world. It can be traced. And so this establishes the book of Luke as a historical document. It's historical. No question about that. And you'll notice that uh, according to the Jewish custom, Jewish laws, that the Lord Jesus Christ was taken by Mary and Joseph to the temple. And there, during the time of the Passover, and you'll notice carefully that this is a, this is a, um, it's a very important date with Israel because it reminds them of where they were and where God brought them from. In plain words, it's, a, it's the feast day of deliverance, the Passover. You know what happened over there in the book of Exodus. They killed the Passover lamb and the death angel came through at midnight, killed all the firstborn that did not have the blood over the doorpost and lintel. And that, of course, was a sign. That blood of the doorpost and lintel was a sign of the blood that was applied at Calvary that keeps the death angel away from us. So it's a beautiful type. But here in the book of Luke, chapter number 2, I want to deal with some very personal human, uh, humanity, personal human interest issues. Because the Bible says, that his parents, and of course use parents in a generic sense. The scripture nowhere ever called Joseph the father of Jesus. Mary did, but the Bible never does. And the scripture says over here in verse number 41, they went to Jerusalem and then they left and they didn't check to see if he was with the group. Notice carefully that they left with a company. Verse number, chapter number 44 and verse number uh, ch chapter 2, verse 44. They supposing him to have been in the company when a day's journey. And the reason they traveled in companies or in caravans is because of the uh, highwaymen. For example, there was a group 2,000 years ago called the Sakari, and it's taken from the word for dagger. They were literally dagger men, and they would fall down upon a uh, group of people, and they'd rob them and kill them and take everything that they had away from them, like they did in India when these uh, followers of, of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the goddess of death, I can't think of her name right now, uh, Kali, Kali, Kali. They were thugs, thuggery, thuggy. Is what they were called. They'd fall on people and kill them and then take their bodies and bury them. So they followed, they left in a company. And the reason they did, of course, is to protect themselves. But they did not look to see and make certain that the Lord Jesus Christ was with them. Big mistake. We need him wherever we go. We need him wherever we go. And don't ever assume that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to walk the way you walk. <laughs> Or walk where you walk. We need to walk in fellowship with him. Being attuned to the Holy Spirit. But I want you to notice carefully. The Bible says that they knew not. They knew not. Verse number 43. The scripture says. And they. Joseph and his mother knew not of it. So they didn't know. And so they blissfully went on their way. But then the Bible says in verse 44. But they supposing him to have been in the company. What a day's journey. And they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance, and when they found him not. Can't you imagine now what began to set in with these people? Panic. Panic. 
I don't know of a, I don't know of a worse thing that could happen to anyone than to lose a child. It's horrible. It's an unbelievable torment that people go through. And here in Tennessee, East Tennessee, we've had a number of cases where children have come up missing and they never found them. Little David Martin. Um, uh, was it David Martin? Um, Dennis. Dennis. Dennis Martin. Thank you. Uh, back in the 60s, I think it was, came up missing. And everybody put all of their effort into it for days, weeks, and they could not find a single trace of that boy. To this day, to this day, no one knows what happened to Dennis Martin. I dug into it pretty deeply here a few weeks back and found out there's some things that happened that are quite odd. And they saw some stuff very odd as it related to that. But it's my understanding that his father just passed away not too long ago and he spent his whole life without his son. Can you imagine how they imagine that? Well this is what the, this is how these people feel because their son, their son, I speak in a generic term again, Mary's son was lost. They didn't know where he was. They didn't know if he'd been being kidnapped or what. And so this sets the stage for what follows. Remember now terrible anguish and sorrow they're going through. Verse number 45, and when they found him not, they returned back to Jerusalem. They backtracked and followed their tracks back to where they had been. So they went back to Jerusalem, seeking him. Verse 46, it came to pass after three days they found him in the temple. Now it's kind of unclear exactly the situation as it, uh, as it unfolds here. Whether they were, this is three days to get to where he was or three days searching him out. I believe it was three days looking for him in Jerusalem. I mean one day to get back and then two more days searching trying to find this young man. And, but if they'd only thought about who they had they'd have gone straight to the temple. Amen. They would have. Because that's his father's house. But they couldn't find him until the temple was the last thing. And they went to the temple. And when they went to the temple, the Bible says in verse number 46, the scripture says, And as they came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And obviously he was oblivious to Joseph and his mother. I mean, as far as he's concerned, they should have known where he was. <laughs> I mean, he's 12 years old now. Bar Mitzvah, son of the law. Bar is son. Mitzvah is the law. Mitziot is the law. So he's the son of the law. In other words, he's coming into manhood. He's no longer just a little child around. He's now coming into manhood. And you need to understand something. 2,000 years ago, the Jews took it very seriously about teaching their children the law and the word of God. This is why Paul told Timothy, he said, From a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, able to make thee wise in the salvation. It was very important that they learn the Scripture because that's their identity. That's who they are. That's where they came from. They didn't need anything that Rome had. They needed nothing from Athens. They needed nothing from India. They had the Word of God and they knew it. And they knew it. And so he's sitting in the midst of the law, of the doctors of the law. Now there's two, two basic lines of thought back then. One was a fellow named Shammai and the other was Hillel. Uh, Gamaliel that you read about in the book of Acts was a disciple of Hillel. And it was a little bit more of the liberal perspective of the scripture and Shammai was more of a well, more of a hard-nosed conservative Judaism has always had its sages and when someone says what do the Jews believe which Jews <laughs> because you have to know who you're talking to to know what they believe and you know 2,000 years ago they'd made the word of God of none effect. The Talmud did not exist 2,000 years ago in written form. But the oral law that they claim that was given to Moses at Sinai did. And so when he's sitting here he's talking to the doctors of the law. Surely he had a knowledge of everything he needed to know. The scriptures, the first thing that came to his mind. The two on the road to Emmaus. He said, O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe what the prophets have said. Ought not Christ to have suffered and then enter into his glory? He laid it out to them very clearly. There is a twofold aspect to his ministry. First coming, second coming. That's a big deal. So to the doctors of the law in the temple, they surely understood that he knew 
There was the first coming, then the second coming. He came the first time as the suffering servant. He'll come the second time as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So they were amazed. Verse 47, they were astonished at his understanding and answers. Who taught him? I'm sure they said. Here's a 12-year-old boy that's been with his mom and dad all these, all these years. Who taught him? What school did he go to? What, uh, what sage did he sit under? None of them. None of them. Look what it says over here in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 51. And uh, chapter 50, rather. And it'll give you an idea of how uh, the Lord Jesus Christ learned what he learned. Isaiah chapter 50, verse, low, uh, verse number 4. Isaiah 54, chapter 50, verse 4. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning, he wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. And then if you have any doubt about who the context is talking about, look at verse 6. I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Now I want you to look at this carefully. This is a very important scripture because this is a scripture that contrasts. There's going to be a contrast in here. And I want you to see the contrast because you begin to get a hold of the mind of God. Now look at this. Verse 7, For the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? There's the question. Let us stand together. Who is mine adversary? He's calling the devil out right there. Yes. Look carefully. Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? Lo, they all shall wax old as a garment. The moths shall eat them up. Who is among you that feareth the Lord, Jehovah, that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. All right, now that's good, isn't it? <clears throat> trust in the Lord to give you light. Lean not to your own understanding. In all thy ways he'll direct thee. Now look at the next verse, verse number 11. Behold all ye that kindle a fire, that compass yourselves about with sparks. Go ahead, he said. This is mockery. This is God mocking them. Go ahead, he says. Walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks that ye have kindled. This shall ye have of mine hand. Ye shall lie down in sorrow. In plain words, if you reject the, the light, the true light, you reject that, what are you left with? You're left with your own devices. You're left with your own wisdom. You're left with your own understanding and how that you can, then how that you make sense of things. Let me read something for you tonight from one of the most brilliant men that ever walked this earth. Let me read it for you. He said this. He said, we know nothing about God and the world at all. All our knowledge is but the knowledge of school children. Possible, possible we shall know a little more than we do now. But the real nature of things that we shall never know never. Now I'm not agreeing with everything he says, but I want you to get the context and the way he's thinking. Listen to this. He says, I see a pattern, but my imagination cannot picture the maker of the pattern. I see a clock, but I cannot envision the clockmaker. The human mind is unable to conceive of the four dimensions. So how can it conceive of God? He's saying God exists. But how are you going to comprehend and understand him? Listen carefully. Before whom a thousand years and a thousand dimensions are as one. You know who said that? Albert Einstein. The father of the nuclear weapon. A brilliant man. A Jew. That rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. He had a lot of good things to say about him. He said, when I read the New Testament, he says, it enthralls me, the life of this Galilean 2,000 years ago. But this Jew, Albert Einstein, said, and think of who we're talking about now, that this created universe is so far above us that we're nothing but school children. 
And I agree with that, don't you? And that for us to elevate our mind to the level of God, oh, you're so arrogant. And how foolish are we? Right? Yes. For who a thousand years is but a day. And here's what he says. A thousand years and a thousand dimensions are as one. Of him, to him, through him, and from him are all things that Bible says. Known unto God are all of his works. Lean not to thine own understanding. You don't serve God because you've got him figured out. You serve him because you love him. His creation shows his power. His power. Redemption shows his love. That's the twofold aspect that we have of God, and both of them can be, you can, you can, you can outline both of these uh, ad finitum. His power by his spoken word, by Ra, he brought into existence. I was looking at some photographs taken from the Hubble telescope. How many of you remember the Hubble telescope? They sent it up, and then they had a problem with it, and the mirror was a little, a little blurry or something, so they sent up a satellite, and they sent up some astronauts, and they went in there, and they, they replaced the mirror from, uh, on, on, they, you know, they made one on the earth, and they took it up, and they replaced it, and then the tub Hubble telescope began to do what they put it up there to do. It looked way off into the universe, and what they said was, and it's remarkable, the guy doing the commentary, he said, we didn't pick any particular place. We just took it and shot it out into space. We didn't aim it at a planet. We didn't aim it at a sun. Nothing. He said, we just shot it out into space. And he said, my, 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 what's out there? And I say to you, my, 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 how big is your God? If God's big enough to make all of that, he's big enough to make you. And me. Who hath made man, that Bible says. Yeah. So he set them, he talked to the doctors of the law, and he confounded them. And they knew among themselves that he was already way past them. They knew that here's one who had a grasp of the scripture that was beyond human ability. They knew that somebody was talking to them that was not like everybody else. And he wasn't. The Lord Jesus Christ, though he was man, he was the God-man. None before him ever existed, none during his life ever existed, and none will ever exist in the future. That's him. There's only one Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Bless his name. So his understanding was remarkable and beautiful. Now I want you to notice what happens here. This, this, is, this, is, this is quite a thing. Look at chap, uh, chapter three, 2, verse number 48. Verse 48. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? This is a rebuke coming from Mary. Why have you dealt this way with us? Why'd you put us through this? See? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. This is the last time that Joseph is mentioned in the Bible. Right here. This is the last time. Now, his genealogy is mentioned, but this is the last time the direct reference is made to Joseph. We don't know how long he lived. We don't know how he died. We don't know any of this. The Holy Spirit does not record it for us. The Holy Spirit records Joseph here. And that's it. He's gone. And Joseph was a good man. Don't misunderstand me. Joseph loved the Lord. He walked. He, he was a good man. And no, no doubt in my mind whatsoever, Joseph was a saved man. No question. But this is the last time that Joseph is mentioned. And Mary said, I have sought thee sorrowing. Now the first thing that is recorded in the Bible that Christ says, what is it? What is the first thing in the Bible recorded, now recorded, that he said? You're fixing to come upon it. Look at chapter number 2, verse number 49. He said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not? That I must be about my father's business. There it is. First thing he ever, that's recorded, that he ever said. Amen. He said, what are you looking for? Don't you know what I'd be doing? Did you have any idea? Yeah. Have I been with you all these 12 years and yet you don't understand? <laughs> all right. Amen. And Mary should have. Because right. I want you to watch this. Watch this. Verse 50. They understood not the saying which he spake to them. Now watch the mother. 
And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. Right. Amen. You see, she was the only one of her kind. Yeah. There was never one before her. There will never be another one. She's the virgin daughter of Zion, the virgin that gave birth to the God-man. There's only one Mary. And she said right here, she pondered these things and kept them in her heart. Now look at Luke chapter number 1, verse 26. We have to give Mary a lot of grace and a lot of leeway. We really do. Because an angel comes upon her and says, you're going to have a child. Now she says to her, now how's this going to happen? Well, that's a natural answer. Luke 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, Gabriel, that means man of God, the, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee to Na Nazareth. All right. To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, for the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. Notice how the Holy Ghost keeps calling her a virgin. <laughs> and the angel came into her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. When she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. The angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Yeah. Now you have 46 chromosomes in your body. 23 you got from your mother, 23 you get from your daddy. All of you ladies tonight, all you have are X chromosomes. The men have an XY chromosome. This is the thing, the little thing shaped like an X. It has in it, balled up inside of it, a lot of proteins that have your DNA. It's in those chromosomes. And that literally tells your bodies, the cell structure, what to do. It's already a language pre-recorded before the foundation of the world. God created DNA. Now, how in the world did Mary, a virgin daughter of Zion, come up with 23 chromosomes, and then there is no father to give another 23 chromosomes? How many of you remember what... Uh, Who's that Seventh-day Adventist? Uh, Ron White. Ron White. Do you remember what he said? He said that he, got under, he went underneath the Temple Mount and, uh, and he was instructed to go back, into, a, in, back into, a, into an area there and there he found blood, blood that had, that had, that had come through the ground that had fallen upon, the, uh, fallen upon an altar. In other words, that blood from all indications came from where Christ was crucified. Now I'm telling you tonight, this is, this is what this man says. And I've read a lot of his stuff. A lot of people are hard on, on Ron White, but I don't think he was a joker or a faker. Um, he, he was not a professional uh, archaeologist, but I think he did a lot of good. What did he say about that blood? What did he say about that blood? You remember? Pardon? It was alive. It was alive. it have been there 2,000 years. There was something else he said about it. It had 24 chromosomes. Now what's that say? That says that the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, the blood coursing through his veins, he got 23 chromosomes from Mary, right? And one from his father. There is no other blood. Never has been, never will be. There is no other blood that's got 23 chromosomes. <laughs> now Gamit does. Well, Gamit is either the the sperm or the egg, and uh, before they come together, and by the way, that's quite a thing, I don't know if you knew this or not, but the very moment that that sperm impregnates that egg, there's a flash of light. Flash of light. A flash of light. But the gamete, sperm, 23 chromosomes. Egg, 23 chromosomes. Although the mother has 46. Right? Sure you do. We've all got 46. But you see, through the miracle working power of God, this that is created by cells comes in with 23 chromosomes and 23 from the Father, and a zygote comes from that. Where these two, the gametes, come together, they produce what's called a zygote. That zygote has 46 chromosomes. It becomes a, what's it called? 
Well, that's before it's a fetus. Embryo. Yeah. Amen. All right. And then from an embryo, it becomes a what? It becomes a little baby. That's strange stuff. When I went to high school, they didn't know any of that. No. They didn't. I never heard a first word about DNA all the time. In 1953, Crick and Watson discovered it. But they didn't say a thing in high school about DNA. That was in 64. I guess because it takes a while for it to work its way through. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. Amen. 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 God. Amen. Yeah. So the first thing recorded in the Bible that he said was, Wist ye not that I should be about my father's business? What's the last thing he said? That's what I believe. Now some say, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And then he gave up the ghost. But then we have Luke that says he bowed his head. Here's what he says. Uh, Luke chapter number. Uh, let me see. I've got the scripture here. And let's see. And maybe I don't. If I could keep up with something, I'd be dangerous. You know what? Well, Luke says, it is finished. To tell us die. First word he spoke and the last word he spoke while he was alive in this flesh were both spoken at the feast of the Passover. Amen. The Passover. Right. The Passover. And the Apostle Paul said, Christ is our Passover. Amen. 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 <laughs> he is our Passover. Yes. Now, I want you to notice what it says here tonight. Notice carefully. Verse 52. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Stature has to do with humanity. All right? His humanity. He was a fully matured human being. Fully man but also fully God. He increased in wisdom. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me say something tonight about wisdom. Knowledge is not wisdom. You can fill your head full of facts. And I'm, a, I'm so afraid that so much of the education that young people get today when they go off to these colleges and universities, they get their head filled full of facts. But they have no wisdom. The greatest wisdom there is, is the wisdom of God. Amen. The wisdom of God means this is the way that God sees it. And this is the purpose that God has in it. The wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 24 says this, But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Here a person is the wisdom of God. In plain words, wisdom becomes personified. So what's that mean? That means that everywhere Jesus went, the wisdom of God was going. Everything that our Lord Jesus Christ said, that was the wisdom of God speaking. Yes. Everything the Lord Jesus Christ did, that was the wisdom of God doing it. And that, of course, is just three parts, aspects of it. It covers a whole lot of ground. Proverbs chapter number 8, verse 22, if you'd like to turn there with me. Proverbs 8, 22. Here's what it says. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of His way, before His works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ere the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. In plainer words, before the creation, before the creation, the wisdom of God is personified. Amen. And this is a mystery. This is one of the, they call it a sublime passage because this is the Godhead interacting with each other. In verse number 27, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. He set a compass upon the face of the depth. When he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment. 
when he appointed the foundations of the earth. Then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. Here's the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is sitting in here tonight. This is the manifestation of the wisdom of God. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places. In other words, I'm going to show you something. The principalities, the powers, spiritual wickedness in high places, all of the demonic realm, all of the evil spirits. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's no way that my mind I cannot comprehend what God can know. I can't do it. And all I can do is observe as much as possible for a human being what God is doing. But I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you that his church, which is made up of born-again believers tonight, yes. born-again believers, born of the Spirit of the living God, Satan no more knows who his body, who his bride is than a man in the moon. All he can do is try you, check you out, come upon you and uh, yeah, sift you like he did Peter and then in the process of that he'll find the wisdom of God the wisdom of God put Christ on the cross the wisdom of God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin the wisdom of God raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand the wisdom of God will call him one day and he'll appear in the heavens as the king of kings and the lord of lords yes. that's the manifest wisdom of God but there's more to it than that because that's only yes. what we can see and I agree with Einstein when he says we are but children we are but children now a man like this that says that folks you're talking about a brilliant man. Yeah. And he says that we are but children when it comes to the creation. The creation. Mm -hmm. And I have to agree with him. Amen. I have to agree with him. I have to, I have to agree with him. Absolutely. No question in my mind about it. The creation is greater than, than, uh, than our ability to comprehend. Right. This is why Paul mentions it in the book of Romans chapter 1. That because of the creation they're without excuse. They can see the creation of God. They're without excuse. What excuse do you mean? They cannot say there is no God. When you see this creation, folks, where do you think this came from? Yeah. I was watching an interview yesterday with, uh, what's his name? The atheist Dawkins. 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 And they asked Dawkins this question. They said, all right, now, you know, we know who you are and what you believe and all this and that. And, and where did life come from? got real quiet we're talking about life now not where rocks come from where did life come from we're not talking about planets and stars where did life come from Dawkins sat there for a little while he's quiet and then he said this he said well he said there's a good possibility that alien where did it come from? well I know there's that there's a cycle <laughs> but alien 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 that's what he started talking about. Aliens. Panspermia, in other words. Created. Anything than to believe in Jehovah. Right. The Lord Jesus Christ. You know why they don't want to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Because he's moral. He's holy. He's righteous. Yes. And the God that we serve tonight is an eternal, holy, righteous being. And the only way you can know him in truth is to know him through the Son of God. Yes. You don't control him. He controls you. That's true. He's God. Lord. Thank He's with, That's the wisdom of God. Yes. Bless his righteous name. Amen. Well, he, Mary found him. <laughs> Mary found him. She found him. He was sitting in his father's house. <laughs> his father's house. Father, bless your word. An opportunity we have to come together tonight. Bless it to the hearts of the people.
Lord, all we can do is stand back in awe and say, Oh my, oh my, what you've created and now what you've done for mankind. We love you and we bless you and we exalt you for that. We lift you high and mighty. We lift thee up. In your holy name I pray. Amen.